Hello and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. I'm Steve Marks, Chair of CMC's Board of Trustees and President of Hanna News Service here in Columbus. We welcome everyone watching on the live stream. Thanks for joining us. CMC is uh, pleased to present today's forum, Ohio Pre-Primary Election Analysis, sponsored by Hanna News Service, the Ohio Farm Bureau Federation, and Civic Point. A, spe a special thank you to our sponsors. Well, it seems that the headlines changed by the hour. Last Friday, we expected to be discussing the results of Ohio's primary, not the primary which might be happening in June. But here we are. We're only just beginning to understand the impacts of coronavirus on our daily lives, and now we're exploring its impact on our electoral process. Let's get right to it. Please welcome, by phone, the managing editor of Sabato's Crystal Ball at the University of Virginia Center for Politics, Kyle Kondik. Associate Professor of Political Science at Otterbein University, Dr. Latrice Washington. Ohio State House News Bureau Chief, Karen Kassler. And our host, President and CEO of New Visions Group, Derek Clay. Derek, the floor is yours. Great. Well, thank you all for being here. For our guests uh, that are streaming with us, thank you for this very unusual and an un, an unprecedented uh, forum that we're having this morning. I want to first thank the Columbus Metropolitan Club. I want to thank the Jane Scott as well, our panelists, and you at home. We want to thank you as well. So we'll get right to it. So, panelists, you ready? Let's do it. All right. So Arizona, Illinois, and Florida all voted yesterday, but Ohio did not. Uh, was that the right choice, and how will this affect voting moving forward? Karen. Well, I can't say right or wrong. As a journalist, it wouldn't be right for me to say right or wrong. Uh, I will tell you it was chaotic. That whole day was one of the longest days that I can remember because 10 o'clock in the morning, we were told the election was on. Mm -hmm. And then by 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we were told that a lawsuit was going to be filed that would delay the election. And then that lawsuit got filed in the afternoon, and then I think the idea was that the judge with whom the lawsuit was filed, and again, this wasn't a lawsuit that was filed by the state. It was two plaintiffs who sued the state because they were fearful that going out to vote would endanger their health, and, and they wanted, they were trying to support the state's move of the primary. The state did not oppose the lawsuit. I think the thought was that the judge would go along with it. Well, the judge didn't go along with it. The right. judge said he didn't have the authority to order the move, moving of the election and that it would set a terrible precedent. So then there was another lawsuit filed in the Ohio Supreme Court from another plaintiff. And uh, in the end, an order came down from uh, Ohio Department of Health Director Dr. Amy Acton saying that because of a significant risk to the health and safety of not only voters but also poll workers, that the vote would be off and the polling places would be closed. Sure. So it, it was quite extraordinary. Yeah. And whether it's right or wrong is for other people to decide. And of course, there's lawsuits now trying to, to figure out what we're going to do next. But it was truly something I never expected to see, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And Kyle, we're going to save you for last. Latrice, what's your, what's your take on this? I don't, I don't take a position of right or wrong. I think when you consider all the moving parts and you consider health, and the fact that the United States is not prepared and the state of Ohio is not prepared. At some juncture, you have to make a decision. And so to err on the side of caution makes sense. Um, I just thought it was a wonderful lesson in all the things that I attempt to teach <laughs> that <laughs> oftentimes people are not interested in and don't think it's relevant until we see politics play out. Um, the question of, OK, can the health department override like how does that work you know so just watching people finally talking about it and people on facebook and they're like they're tweeting they're trying to figure it all out and they're what at least they're watching that was important now the consequences we'll we'll see i think there's there's a plethora of ways that this will likely play out there's some anger there's some frustration how long does that linger does it does it subside by June? Um, will the same number of people show up in June? Or will some of that have subsided back to what we normally see in primary elections, which is low voter, voter turnout? It's not been what we've seen throughout the nation. 
So the expectation was yesterday it likely would have been a large number here as well. And um, we'll see what the electorate has to say about it when Absolutely. it's time. Yeah. And I will say, sure. I was at one of the early voting centers on Sunday, the one here in, in Franklin County, and it was, it was pretty busy. Mm -hmm. right. And there were people who were telling me that they plan to vote early, that they always vote early, because they have that opportunity, they enjoy that, that freedom. But there were people who were worried about exactly what did happen, that there would be some confusion on Tuesday, mm -hmm. that maybe the polls would even be closed. Mm -hmm. And so that's why they came out to vote. But it was just the kind of scenario that in a pandemic situation you didn't want to see people standing close together, moving around. I mean, you're supposed to maintain that six foot distance, right. you know, and that, that was just not possible with right. 130 voting machines in a room about the size that we're in right now. It, it's, it's kind of a cramped space. Yeah. And so that, it, I think that there would have been some good turnout, but I think there were a lot of concerns. Sure. So Kyle, you're looking at this from an outsider. Uh, what, what's your take of all of this? Uh, you, you are in communications with the, the director of communications for the Virginia Center of Politics. What's your take on all this? Well, I mean, I think, you know, one, one practical matter is that I think Bernie Sanders was saved from another double-digit loss by Ohio's primary moving back because um, he got beaten pretty badly by Joe Biden in the other three states, and all the indications were that he was uh, um, going to lose the uh, Ohio primary uh, uh, by, you know, some, a similar kind of double-digit margin. Now, there are some indications going on as we speak that uh, apparently the Sanders campaign uh, has, has uh, suspended its Facebook advertising, and some people or maybe interpreting that as maybe he's reconsidering whether he's going to stay in the race or not. You know, more broadly, the calendar has been affected not just in Ohio, but also in some other states in that Georgia moved back, Louisiana moved back, uh, some other states have moved back, Georgia and Louisiana, particularly given how poorly Sanders is going to do in this, has done in the South. Um, that's actually helpful to him in that those are, those are losses that he doesn't have to take right now, uh, similarly to Ohio. So it's possible that, that all this happening might may allow for Sanders to stay in the race longer, even though, for all intents and purposes, Joe Biden is the uh, presumptive nominee at this point. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a wrinkle here. I mean, obviously, the, I think that, that the, the, uh, the governor and his, uh, and his team did this for, you know, for, for public health reasons, and I think that they've been uh, – um, their response to this, I think, has been, been – uh, uh, pretty good in a lot in a lot of ways, although um, there was certainly a lot of confusion about the vote and, and how how they really cut it very close in terms of deciding to uh, to postpone the primary. And you know, the other thing too is I, I feel bad for a lot of these the, the candidates, not just not the presidential candidates necessarily, but um, a lot of the down ballot folks, whether they're running for you know state house or senate or for the U.S. House of Representatives. And that yesterday was supposed to be you know the the, the conclusion of their campaigns, and now their campaigns go on for another two and a half months and it's frankly it's unclear how effective people can campaign at right now given the um, the restrictions uh, and, and people self-quarantining and all that um, and also who knows how uh, these races might evolve there may be folks who and would have won yesterday who may end up going up going on to lose uh, uh, on, on June 2nd so it's, it's very disruptive in that sense even though of course all of our lives are being disrupted right now and really for, for good reason or good preventative reason. Absolutely. Thank you. So you probably have heard the news by now that, that Bernie Sanders is uh, exiting the, the campaign. So what does that mean for the primary moving forward? What does it mean for the DNC? Do the, Brony, do the Bernie bros come over to the Biden camp? I would hope that Bernie Sanders supporters would actually move over. I think part of what has been written a lot about is the Democratic primary process and how it drags out and how divisive it tends to be. And now looking at June, at least before the last states kind of figure it out, that's a four-month window. So I would hope strategically if Bernie Sanders supporters want to defeat Donald Trump, that they would do what is not just expedient, but what is the commonsensical approach mm -hmm. to deal with it and hopefully figure out how to reconcile and how to do it in a way that is like authentic because I don't believe the people will buy what they believe or perceive to be anything less than that. Sure. Okay. I think the question 
that I would have on that, will Bernie, first of all, it, it seemed that, at least in the last debate, there seemed to be some acknowledgement that both candidates would support the other mm -hmm. if, whenever the nomination is actually determined, and with Bernie out, obviously. <laughs> I mean, Tulsi Gabbard's still there, so I guess they're, you know, but I think uh, Biden's delegate lead is, is insurmountable by anybody at this point. Um, but, the, you know, voters can be advised by the candidate they support, but they still end up doing what they want to do. And there are, there's been a lot of social media conversations about people who support Bernie Sanders saying that they will only vote for Bernie, mm -hmm. that they did not want, they, they don't believe that Biden represents the change that they want. Mm -hmm. Whether they choose to do that is the question, because it seems like the options are really uh, a vote for Donald Trump mm -hmm. or a vote for the Democrat, because if you vote for if you don't vote, if you vote for third party, if you if you make another choice that seems to support Donald Trump's reelection. Right. And so that's going to be the question I think for a lot of Democrats who are disappointed that out of a field of how many were there? 26 at one point yeah. that this is the candidate some there are a lot of Democrats who are disappointed that this is their candidate. They wanted somebody else. So I, I think they're going to have to make that choice. And I think now of course Joe Biden's choice for vice president becomes really, really interesting and really important to a lot of people because there's a field out there sure. that's pretty large who he could choose from. Yeah, Kyle, what's your take on this, and do you, and who do you think that uh, Biden will eventually choose as his uh, nominee or, or his running mate? So Biden flat out said in the debate on Sunday night that he was going to uh, pick a woman as his as his running mate. I mean, I think that's very much, but I think that's a smart decision and also reflective of the fact that I think the days of all white male presidential tickets, particularly on the Democratic side, is probably over, given that um, the Democratic Party is both the, the sort of the more racially diverse party uh, and also, um, you know, women are generally likelier to vote Democratic, men are a little bit likelier to vote um, Republican. Uh, Amy Klobuchar seems to be getting a lot of buzz as a potential candidate. I think Kamala Harris is another one. Um, one a few interesting historical notes about vice presidential selection. First of all, for whatever reason, Democrats really seem to pick senators very often. In fact, I think I think it's 15 of the last 18 uh, Democrats selected as running mates um, were uh, were current or former members of the U.S. Senate, whereas Republicans tend to pick sort of people with more diverse uh, uh, governing backgrounds. Mike Pence, uh, uh, current vice president, former governor of Indiana, is a good example of that. And so I don't know exactly why that is that senators get picked very often, but they, they do seem to get get picked. Uh, um, pretty often uh, by Democrats, and also interestingly, it's also relatively common for the for the running mate selection to be someone who actually did not run for president um, in the in the current uh, cycle. Um, and again, uh, like Mike Pence and also Tim Kaine uh, from 2016, they were not presidential candidates in that cycle. Now, uh, Joe Biden was in 2008, although he wasn't a particularly prominent one. Um, and so, if, if say if Klobuchar or Harris were to get selected, it actually would be uh, not really in keeping with that history in that more often than not, the, 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 not, the, the VP pick is someone who, again, who was not a candidate. Um, but again, it seems like the people getting mentioned most prominently now are folks um, who have been, uh, you know, who are running. And again, um, you think about Klobuchar and, and Harris, both, and of course, both sitting U.S. senators. So they fit that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, a part of the, you know, the, 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 uh, the usual Democratic VP choice uh, pretty well. Absolutely. Because, like, yeah. every Democrat in the world was running, wasn't it? Right. <laughs> yeah, That's right. why they're all... I consider yeah. running at one point, you know. It's, <laughs> <Very much. laughs> all right, we're going we're gonna to move on to another question here. So, obviously, the coronavirus has had um, just an unprecedented uh, effect on our, way, our daily way of life. So, seeing the results of yesterday and, and the debacle that we had with the election, how do you feel that this virus uh, is going to change the way we we vote in the future? I mean, what are there going to be changes to the voting process? Well, I, that's one of the lawsuits right now from the Ohio Democratic Party is saying that they want the date for the election to be April 28th and it to be an, an all in uh, all mailed in, mm -hmm. no in person voting. Which for people who that's a big deal. You go to your polling place, you see the same people, you you get to interact with people, you see how many people turn out, you see uh, how many people in your community are involved. For some people, that's a big deal to not have that routine, that tradition, that that time that you just 
go and vote, you know, that's a big deal. But for other people, it's it's great because early voting for many folks has been something that they embrace, they enjoy. I mean, 100 as of last Tuesday, which was a lifetime ago, uh, the Secretary of State's last count of early ballots, there were 194,522 that had actually been cast in person or returned by mail. Right. So early voting is definitely catching on with people. Um, and it's catching on with Democrats more than Republicans, at least in terms of, of returning those and, and casting them in person. 53% uh, of that number were Democrats, 42% Republicans. But, um, you know, I, I think what is decided about this primary that never happened yesterday is going to be critical to decide what people, how people might behave in voting going forward. Right. Yeah. I, I agree, um, especially for the elderly and the African-American voting bloc, going to the polls is beyond symbolic. Um, it's almost ritualistic. And so as they think back to their history, and, and so they tend to hold to that, um, my mother included, and lots of other seniors are like, no. I'm like, I can take you early. I will not go early. I'm voting on right. election day. <laughs> um, but beyond that, then what mechanisms will we use? Can we get to an agreement? You know, historically, there's been a lot of talk about you know, reforming how we vote. Then there's the issue of trust. So if they're all mailed in, will they all be counted? How many people have real trust in the system that that will be the case? How will they know? So I, I think it'll be a lot more conversations about what the electorate wants that to look like. And then that also becomes a financial issue as well, mm -hmm. potentially, Absolutely. depending on what mechanisms are proposed and what are accepted. Um, and yeah, we have lots of technology. Right. But not all of it is a trustworthy way yeah. to cast a ballot. Well, just this morning, I was on two conference calls that I could not get into because <laughs> there were technical issues. So as people continue to uh, adjust to this way of life, we may be faced with some of those types of situations. I was just going to say, I think we're going to find out an awful lot about bandwidth and uh, right. capabilities That's of systems right. to handle working from home, learning from home, which all the kids are doing, and then just, you know, you're at home and you're going crazy because there's no sports and there's no concerts and there's no movie theaters, and so you're streaming everything. I think we're going to learn a lot about technology in the next couple of years. now. Absolutely. Well, John, yeah, yeah. But, but you need technology exactly, to yeah. access it. Kyle, what do you think? Uh, so there are there are pluses and minuses of early voting that I think have been sort of vividly displayed by uh, the primary experience that so far this this cycle. Uh, but one of the big topics of conversation pre coronavirus was that in states like um, like California, for instance, where there's where it's very easy to vote by mail and to and to vote early, and a lot of people cast their ballots early, that there were a lot of wasted votes basically for candidates who at the time of the primary in, in California no longer were on the ballot. So a lot of people were voting for, you know, Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar, who got out right on the eve of the California primary, um, and even in, in Air, like in Arizona, which is a heavy um, vote by mail, early voting state. Um, the the, tally, the the current totals between Biden and Sanders, I think Biden is up something like forty three percent to thirty one percent for Sanders, which means that uh, uh, roughly what is that about fifteen. 15, 16, 17 percent of people voted for candidates who are no longer in the race. And so that's sort of the downside is that in a primary environment where things are fast moving and candidates are, are you know, moving, on, moving out um, after they may lose, that you have a lot of wasted votes. On the other hand, uh, both Arizona, which I mentioned, and also Florida, are very heavy early voting states, and turnout ended up being really pretty good in both states, but particularly considering that Election Day turnout was probably depressed, obviously, because of this crisis, whereas in Illinois, which has early and absentee voting, but it's not as much of the voting culture in that state, um, turnout was definitely down from 2016, and I think that was sort of reflective of of the fact that people just didn't want to go out and vote in this in this uh, in this climate. Um, so on one hand, I definitely think that particularly in the midst of a crisis like this, early and absentee voting can allow more people to participate and participate safely. On the other hand, it, pre-coronavirus, people who cast their votes early may have regretted that they voted early because they end up voting for people who were not viable candidates on the actual formal election day in their respective states.
Absolutely. You know, we had, uh, and this, this question is more so for our, our local folks here. Um, there were several races on the ballot uh, yesterday that were very significant. You know, one was the, the congressional race, the, the third congressional district. And if we, in your estimation, if voting day was voting day yesterday, how do you think that those races, those high profile races like that will be affected? Well, I mean, you're talking about Joyce Beatty yes, and Joyce Morgan Beatty Harper. Joyce Beatty and Morgan Harper, actually. Morgan Harper was the only real opposition I think Joyce Beatty has had since she's been in Congress. I, I, I think the, uh, I think it's likely that Beatty would have won. I don't think I'm going too far out on a limb on that because she's maintained a level of popularity. Yeah. Her, the vote for her over the last couple of years has been pretty strong. Uh, but certainly Morgan Harper was running a very aggressive campaign, mm -hmm. uh, really pushing on that uh, progressive angle. And Morgan Harper was out on Sunday when I was at the Early yeah. Vote Center ta talking to people and, and uh, has, has really been trying to, uh, she's been running ads. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's, and, and mm -hmm. Part of that is because whoever won that race is going to win in November. Absolutely. And that's yeah. the way it is all through the state because of the way that the districts are drawn. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, those primaries were key all over the state for challengers who were hoping to maybe break through and, and maybe win those contests. And now, you know, you could look at it and say, hey, they have another couple of weeks to campaign. But for candidates who don't have a whole lot of money, I think that's going to be a serious problem because, again, People are home, they're not doing anything. If you're well-funded, I would think this would be a great opportunity to start just bombarding the internet and local TV with ads. If you don't have the money to do that, though, you can't do that, and you can't right. campaign, can't hold a town hall, can't go to a rally, can't send out canvassers. It, it's probably very difficult for those yeah. people. Yeah, Latrice. I agree. Um, one thing I will say, that is my district. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I know it well. Um, the issue is, as an incumbent, obviously Joyce Beatty has a track record. She also is very present. She makes she she works very hard to be present in that district. Um, I into her and at Lowe's yes. and Home Depot. So yeah, that's <laughs> true. Very <laughs> present and um, and heavily accessible. Mm -hmm. I think for Morgan Harper, it, it's it's refreshing to see that someone okay, I, I'm going to challenge this person that is probably almost inevitable that they're going to win. One thing I will say, um, living in that district and having seen some firsthand, I think candidates, and this is in case Morgan Harvard wants to stay in the trenches, you want to find a, a, a tactful way if you want to point out issues that you believe are problematic with an, inc an incumbent mm -hmm. that, has a, that has real roots in a community that may be assertive and aggressive but you don't want to cross that line where you then start to look, your, your, your integrity becomes questioned mm -hmm. about who you are and your character, that you go that way. Mm -hmm. um, I will say on a personal note, met her at church, mm -hmm. and all I could get was, I have a law degree from Stanford, and that wasn't enough for me I, I'm not, I did vote, but and I had to make a decision. But that wasn't going to be a selling point for me. I have a PhD from Howard. In that environment that she was in, there's so many professional people. So translate that degree into, although you've not served perhaps on the grassroots level, how, what do you have in your background that shows that you believe you're suitable for, that you're passionate about it, and you are the better choice? And I think that's for, for the way a lot of campaigns are, are happening. Everything's heavily negative. And I would imagine even now people are saying, I need to know why I need to choose you over this person. Don't tell me that they're bad. Tell me why you are the candidate for me. Sure. And I don't know when we'll get to that place, yeah. because every time we think we've gotten to a new low, <laughs> we get to another low. Right. Um, and this is not with Morgan Hubbard, it's just in general the way that campaigns tend to go sure. because of the attention span of the electorate. Sure. Kyle, we're going to have you answer this next question first. So um, obviously the, the governor has been leading the response in Ohio uh, around the, the coronavirus. Uh, I would venture to say that he's, he's done a, an excellent job in keeping the uh, public informed. Um, 
but specifically to the primary election. How was this handled by the governor's office? How was it handled by the secretary of state? And what is the role that the legislature plays in this? Kyle. Well, um, you know, a lot of lot to unpack there. Um, I I do think that the the basically you know canceling or postponing the primary at the last minute. I mean, I think the governor made his suggestion at I don't know it was it was mid afternoon on Monday, um, and you know so there wasn't time to call the legislature into session, and the legislature is really the body that, that does it. The fact that the um, um, they tried to kind of orchestrate this this, this lawsuit that the uh, the county judge threw out, and then the the, um, um, uh, the health director just ended up uh, uh, using her power uh, to postpone the primary. I think there was I I personally think it could have been handled better, although I also think that given the fast-moving events, um, I, I think maybe maybe the governor and the administration deserve, a, deserve some benefit of the doubt, particularly because, again, I think their response in, in many other ways has been, has been pretty admirable and certainly um, – certainly is certainly pretty serious but you know again there is a political component here and and i don't i think when, when you're dealing with um political actors as the governor is and and the people you know people in the administration and whatnot you always have to consider that and and uh you know this was something this was a decision that that i do think was sort of indirectly helpful to bernie sanders in this democrat in, in this democratic campaign and that he got he essentially got a got a, a delay in losing ohio and maybe there's a difference in the campaign if he's still running in early june in which ohio is more competitive than it otherwise would have been um i'm not saying that's the reason why the governor made the decision he did but but there are there are political consequences even in the midst uh, of a crisis and so i guess if i were the biden campaign um i might I, I probably would have wanted the primary to happen, um, particularly given that other states voted as voted as as well. Um, but then again, Ohio is also not the only state that has uh, that has that has moved this primary. There are other states that have done it. I, I guess it, I, I think it would have just it would have worked out better and been cleaner if the governor had just decided to do this a couple of days before um, they ultimately decided to move. But again, I, I think a benefit of the doubt is warranted here, um, given the, the fast moving situation. And the fact that I think that uh, the, 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 the crisis has only gotten more serious by the day and almost by, by the hour. So, sure. again, um, uh, I, I think that they, they, we, they, deserve, they deserve a little bit of deference. And then, but, you know, there's also the, um, you know, once you set the precedent of starting to move elections, is that something that then happens in a time of less crisis or under under conditions that are maybe less defensible? Is that you know is does that become part of politics? Which I really hope that that wouldn't be the case, and I think that, that we should try treat this as sort of a, almost a once in a lifetime circumstance. But you know, again, there there there's there's there are um, I think for some people the, the idea of just moving election was also kind of um, kind of eyebrow raising. Um, sure. So there's there's also that. Yeah, and we're going to get to some audience questions in just a second, but I, I do want to follow up on that. Some some people say that this is voter suppression. Some people say it's voter safety. What do you say, Karen? Well, I, I think. I think the order certainly addressed voter safety, mm -hmm. and, and I think there are a lot of folks who are looking at this as they, they were fearful of going out. I mean, I was tweeting out pictures from the Early Vote Center on Sunday, and there were responses really addressing that, saying, how is this safe in an environment where we're being told, don't go close to people, don't stand near people, um, you know, how is this safe? Uh, one thing I thought was interesting, though, when you know, Kyle's talking about this uh, court decision and the, the judge that didn't go along with the idea to move the election, what was really interesting to see was that uh, the two uh, people who were there in court to hear this and to try to challenge this, in a sense, were uh, uh, Representative Jay, or, um, uh, uh, not a representative, I don't think, Jay Stevens and uh, Representative Niraj Antani, mm -hmm. who these two folks were kind of sent there by House Speaker Larry Householder, mm -hmm. who was very concerned about the movement of this election, and largely because he has been involved, he's got candidates that he supported, and there's been a dark money group that's been running ads for the 
campaign for the candidates that he supports. So he was definitely in a political mode there to try to see if this election could go forward because he had some vested political interest here. And I, I just think that that's important to note because obviously the legislature and the governor are going to have to work together to try to figure this out. Larry Householder and Larry Abhoff, the Senate president, I think believe that they're the ones who have the authority to set the election date rather than a court or whatever. And so they're planning on coming back and having session next week. And certainly that's going to be a main thing that they're going to be looking at. Sure. Real quick, Latrice, before we get to some audience questions. So what I will say, I'm not surprised that voter suppression came up because it's a conversation that comes up often when we talk about the state of Ohio, especially um, purging. Mm -hmm. And so um, a lot of individuals are aware, especially last October, I think it was 180,000, and some were wrongfully purged. Mm -hmm. um, so when we consider that that's part of our history, and you consider the politics, <laughs> the right. party of the governor, we have all these other things happening, and, and the question sometimes becomes for individuals, you know, is this another way sure. to suppress the vote of individuals that likely would vote in a way that doesn't promote the status quo? Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that. So for our viewing audience, we are taking questions. If you'd like to submit a question, you can submit them to Q at columbusmetroclub.org. And it's always in our tradition to take audience questions. And uh, Deb Hackathorn, who is a CMC board member and also the chair of our program committee, is curating questions. Uh, Deb, do you, do you have some questions for us? Sure. Happy to ask them. Thanks. Um, I have a question from our good friend Bill Lafayette, who's with Regionomics, runs his own firm. He would like to know, how do you see the crisis affecting politics then through November? Or is it too soon to tell? Anyone? Mm -hmm. Kyle? Um, yeah, so um, here's something, something that's a, a factor that's usually pretty important in presidential elections is um, the state of the economy. Uh, and in fact, some of the, the good um, uh, political science models that try to project the, the you know the, the national uh, popular vote or the electoral college, um, they sometimes rely on second quarter gross domestic product growth as one of the ways to measure the the, the state of the economy. And prior to all of this happening, it seemed like some of these models would actually suggest that, that Donald Trump probably was favored to win a second term in part because um, even though his, his job approval is not very good, the state of the economy is pretty good and he's also – you know, incumbent president running for re-election, and there are certain historical benefits to, to just being an incumbent running again. Um, but it now seems like second quarter GDP growth is going to be horrible. It's probably it's going to be a negative number, um, and maybe a significantly negative number. I mean, I've seen negative four, negative five thrown around. We don't we don't really know. Um, but if you just plug that horrible number into some of these models, all of a sudden the president becomes a significant underdog, historically speaking, for re-election. Um, and we know that the president is very concerned about the state of the economy, as he should be. Um, and the uh, uh, Congress and the president are in the midst of proposing some sort of um, huge stimulus package um, to try to prop up the economy. And certainly there are legitimate reasons to do that, but there are also political reasons to do that, because if the economy tanks, that could really hurt the Republicans, both the president and down ballot Republicans, in the November campaign. Now, we also don't know how forgiving the public will be about a, a recession that um, was sort of the, the cause of, of essentially a um, – um, you could essentially call this a natural disaster, effectively, um, that it's that it's not it was wasn't necessarily something caused by government policy. Although then that also gets into how do people actually feel about the government's response? Do they feel like these steps that we're taking were warranted? How serious do, does the spread of coronavirus become? Um, I think the president has been criticized by a lot of folks for the response, but I don't know if that's necessarily showing up in the polling. And I'd say the jury's still out in terms of how people think the government is responding. So there are a lot of factors at play here, but if you believe, as I did, you know, a month or two ago when this wasn't an issue, that 
hey, the president is buoyed in, in, in for his reelection by the strength of the economy, I think you probably have to then say, well, that's a that's a, an, a, a positive asset that he was banking on that may not be present for him in the fall. And so from that standpoint, you'd have to think his chance of reelection go down, even though this is an unprecedented situation. We don't know what might happen. Maybe the economy rebounds quickly after this crisis passes, but but again, there are a lot of question marks. But it's just from a raw political standpoint, the economy getting worse is is not good for the president. Right. And, and speaking of the economy getting worse, there's an alert right now: Ford, GM, and Fiat Chrysler are shutting down their plants. Yeah. That's a huge deal. I mean, and all of the gains that have happened, the economic gains in the market uh, under Trump are gone. And so that's a huge blow to somebody who has been campaigning on the economy. And uh, it, it's just really, I'm kind of stunned by that. This is, this is a big deal. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, there's been lots of talk that 2020 was going to be a year of recession. And because things are going so well, I think many thought we were going to somehow evade it. Mm -hmm. And the question becomes, does the economic downturn turn into a recession or does it turn into a depression? Right. And they're two distinctively you know, different things. But we also have to deal with the reality, the last recession, there are Americans that are just, were just starting to rebound from that. So how many hits can individuals take? And when we start to talk about, you know, we always, it's the economy, right? It's healthcare. You know, now, now we're adding the it's, but you take the economy and healthcare together, what does that do to individuals that may want something different in terms of their choices? But I also believe much of President Trump's base will not move no matter what. Yeah. Deb, another question from the audience. Sure, we'll do a follow-up on that then. Chris Cloth from ChangeWorks of the Heartland says, given the results of primary elections so far, do you believe the Democrats can or will flip the Senate, and why? Kyle, we're going we're to give that one right to you. I don't think that you should project, use primary results to uh, project forward on uh, the general election. That said, um, the, the, it seems like turnout has been very robust, particularly in the kind of affluent, highly educated suburban areas that um, may have been Republican at one point, but really have been trending Democratic, and particularly since, uh, since Donald Trump uh, became the, you know, the leader of the Republican Party. Um, and uh, one of the, 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 fe the features of the Senate map is that a lot of the key Senate races and some of the, the states that Democrats really have to win in order to win the Senate back are, uh, are in places like North Carolina and Arizona in, in the Sun Belt, where growth in the Democratic Party has been, I think, concentrated in a lot of these suburban areas. And this is why so many Democrats didn't want Bernie Sanders to be the nominee, because they thought that he's basically too left wing for these kinds of voters. And maybe that's right. Maybe that's wrong, um, but that um, Biden did really well in those places in the primary, and it looks like Biden is going to be the nominee. Uh, and so Biden, as the presidential candidate, a lot of Democrats feel will help them not only beat Donald Trump, but also win the Senate. And again, maybe maybe they're right about that, maybe they're wrong about that, but that's certainly how a lot of uh, elected Democrats feel. I personally think the Senate is um, probably still is, – is Republicans have a better shot at the Democrats, but um, events are moving quickly here, and I think that, that the overall electoral outlook for the Democrats over the past several weeks has, has brightened, and part of it is just the, the, that I think that in the midst of an economic crisis, the party out of power probably stands to, to benefit more, more from that than, than the party in power. That's just sort of a, again, a, kind of a basic political dynamic, but th again, this is sort of an unprecedented situation, too. All right. Karen, what do you think? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Kyle do that because I, I, I feel like he's absolutely right about using primary votes and, and to predict elections. I haven't been following the Senate as much just because we don't have a Senate race going on in Ohio. So I, I think Kyle said it sure. great. Sure. Did you want to add anything, Latrice? Or? There's uh, nothing that I really can think of except we, it's possible we could see a flip mm -hmm. everywhere, right? 
change of majority in the House, change of majority in the Senate, you know, um, possibly a, a switch in the White House. Mm -hmm. um, it depends on where the voters want to place blame and how vigilant they're going to be about um, exacting some form of consequence Absolutely. for what they believe is poor preparation, um, especially, you know, Right now, with Corona, if if we had some prior knowledge, you know, it kind of reminds us of 9/11. Were there some mm -hmm. some, you know, kind of we cues that didn't have it team, exactly, for and then it, it's disbanded. So um, I think the candidates and decision makers have to recognize if this period of self isolation does anything. It's giving people a lot of time to not just think, but to read and try to connect dots that they otherwise may not have because they would have been so busy and otherwise occupied. And so I, I think all the candidates need to make sure that they treat the electorate like an educated public because the, the electorate that they will get after this will not be the same electorate they had before. Absolutely. The coronavirus. Absolutely. And for our viewing audience, we are talking about Ohio politics pre-primary, and you can submit your questions to Q at columbusmetroclub.org. I know that Deb has a few more questions for our panelists. Sure. This one comes from Lucy Frank from the city of Columbus, and I think Kyle knows a little bit about this one. Do you think that Ohio will pick the president in the 2020 election? <laughs> What's our chance of either gaining back or maintaining, depending on your perspective, our status as a bellwether state. I, I think I've read a book about <laughs> exactly. that. Exactly. Have I? You're probably one of the few who actually did read it, but I appreciate it. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, you know, Ohio, uh, you know, historically voted, uh, you know, very close to the national, uh, to the national voting, I'd say better than, than any other state over, over more than century long. Um, span, which is what I wrote about in the, in the book on Ohio, but um, in 2016, the state shifted uh, to being, uh, you know, significantly more Republican than the nation in that president won the state by eight points um, while losing the national popular vote by two, and so the Ohio was basically 10 points in terms of margin more Republican than the nation, uh, which was the furthest the Ohio had been um, from the national average since 1932. So it's a, it was it was it was it was pretty striking to see Ohio not really like the nation all that well, um, although the state was still more competitive than, than most states. Um, I, I think that, that, you know, I think we've all heard the, you know, the, the, the true statement that, you know, no Republican has ever won the White House without Ohio. And if, in fact, the state is competitive in the fall and is very close, that probably says something probably broadly negative about the president's chances because, if he's not winning Ohio, well, first of all, if the president loses Ohio, he has no practical electoral college path to, to, to do 70 without Ohio, because if he loses Ohio, um, it probably means he's losing essentially everywhere else in the Midwest outside of Indiana and maybe Iowa. And of course, uh, Ohio, uh, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin really were the, the decisive states, and those states are usually more democratic uh, than, than Ohio is. Um, so again, I think you maybe maybe watch Ohio for the level of campaign activity. You know, if the president is still campaigning in Ohio, to, you know, to the extent that we have in-person campaigning next fall, who knows if we even will. But if the president's visiting a lot, it probably says more broader negative things about the president's chances, whereas if the president and the Democrats are kind of ignoring Ohio, it probably means that the election maybe is, is more, more like 50-50 or um, is more like a um, – uh, is more like leaning leaning toward uh, toward Trump. I don't think uh, I don't think Ohio is really the center of the electoral universe this year the way maybe it has been um, in some previous years. I'd say particularly 2004 was a year when Ohio was, was really and truly decisive. Uh, and certainly the state has gotten a lot of attention since then, but um, maybe not so much in, uh, in, in 2020. Either, either you want to add to that? The only thing I'll add, because I do agree, is um, disproportionately as goes Ohio, so goes the nation. So it, I, I think either way we will be looked at. Um, the question will be what our response is to the new normal that we're experiencing and how much more engaged the electorate actually is. I interviewed Kyle Kondik 
and another elections expert, Mike Dawson, a couple months ago. And I'd love, I, I mean, just, it would be interesting to redo that interview now because you kind of wonder what they think now. I mean, listen to Kyle talk. Things have changed so much potentially. Is this what we're experiencing now going to carry over forward months and months from now and, and change the way that people vote and the way that people think? I mean, I think Latrice is absolutely right. Dr. Washington is absolutely right about these folks having a chance to actually sit down and read and learn and, 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 and consider the implications of what might happen. And I just, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing to think how much has potentially changed in so little time. Sure. I think we got time for a couple more questions. Deb, you have a few more, a sure. couple more? Absolutely. I'll be selfish and ask one of my own. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious, given that you're talking about we're not certain how long the uh, crisis will last. We're not certain what will happen over these, certainly of these next couple of months in terms of campaigning. Are there any specific things we should expect as strategies from candidates that they may employ that are different from what we would typically see during an election? I think you're going to robocall. I think that's still going to be with us. So <laughs> there you go for that one. If you can get through, right? Yeah. <laughs> you might pick up the phone because we have no one else to talk to. Or, uh, <laughs> In many ways, I think we will still see um, a traditional tactic, um, either the selling of fear or the selling of hope. And the question becomes when we, as a nation and as Ohio emerge out of that, where, where do we land? You know, some people are in a state of paranoia. Um, what does that breed? Some people are in a place of hope and saying, this is the time for me to, you know, work my business plan or, you know, develop some things now that I have time to completely commit to it. And so there's hope and there's fear even in how we're addressing this issue. So the question becomes, which becomes the prevailing attitude? post coronavirus and this experience that we've had that is unlike anything that most of us have lived through. Sure. Kyle. I kind of wonder if we'll see um, some strategic changes, uh, and I wonder if maybe uh, uh, this will actually push even more advertising into the digital space, which I think is sort of a growing part of campaign advertising. Um, you know, one of the, so, so many things uh, that people used to watch live on television, they now consume in, in sort of a recorded way. They're able to skip advertising, et cetera. Um, and, you know, one of the few things that people would actually watch live and got huge audiences are live sporting events. And there aren't really any live sporting events taking place anymore, you know, at, at this particular moment. Um, you know, we, we saw with Michael Bloomberg's campaign, of course, he had essentially unlimited amounts of money to spend. Um, but he was advertising in, in different kinds of ways and experimenting. I mean, it seemed like he was paying, you know, social media influencers to sort of weigh in on his behalf. Um, I actually was, would hear Michael Bloomberg advertisements uh, on some of, like, on sports podcasts that I listen to. Uh, I just wonder if we'll start to see political advertising um, seep in, into more different kinds of venues as, as campaigns try to find people where they are, which as of this particular moment, um, where people are is, is you know, cons basically consuming lots and lots of different kinds of media as essentially they're stuck at home. Absolutely. So I think we have time for maybe one more quick question. Uh, if you can keep your responses down to so maybe 30 seconds, that would be great. Uh, Deb. Oh, good. Then I'll pick a controversial <laughs> one. Andy Campbell asked this question. We're hearing about the administration considering giving $1,000 to individuals directly to help during the crisis. Bernie Sanders suggested that we should give $2,000. Does anybody think we're paying for votes? Kyle. I know. <laughs> well, look, um, in all seriousness, uh, the Treasury Secretary uh, supposedly was saying yesterday that unemployment could reach 20 percent, and that actually makes sense to me in that so many Americans work in the service industry, and particularly in bars and restaurants, and if no one's going, you're going to start to see people laid off incredibly, and there's going to be a tremendous amount of human suffering that the federal government is just going to have to step in and try to mitigate. Uh, I mean, tw if, if, if unemployment reaches 20%, I mean, that's like 
that's like Great Depression level employment levels. Maybe not maybe not quite at the height, but um, I mean, un- and unemployment has been um, so low recently. I mean, it would be a, um, a, I think it would be like five times what the current rate is. Um, and so, I, you know, buying votes. I, I mean, yeah, I guess, but but people have to people have to be able to survive this, yeah. and the only way to do that is for is for there to be a a very robust um, government response. And I, again, it seems like a lot of folks yeah. all over the political spectrum are coming to that realization. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. Real quick. Yep. I, I, I have nothing to add, but I, I did want to say before we wrap up, first of all, Representative Jason Stevens, I misspoke that earlier. And secondly, I just, I'm really grateful that people are watching and people are here and that this forum continued on so we could have this conversation. And I, I just think it's really important that we still try to connect like this and share our thoughts and and see each other even if it's virtually. I just think it's a, it's a great opportunity to learn things as well as reach out. So. Absolutely. Um, I, I'd hope that it's more around trying to help people keep their heads above water and not completely drown sure. in what is happening economically. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's not a bad tactic to, to remember, hopefully they will remember who gave it to them. Right. So I wouldn't say bribe. Um, I would say it, it does represent um, almost like a stimulus yeah. package. Yeah. Here's some money to go and spend. Hopefully, this go around, right. individuals will actually use it to pay down some of their debt and pay some of their bills off and not buy you know, large screen televisions and things sure. of that nature. Um, because some of what we're hearing is absolutely devastating between student loans and yeah mortgages and those things so we'll see what we look like yeah, after well, this absolutely well before i turn it over to steve marks our uh presiding officer for the columbus metropolitan club i want to thank our panel i want to thank uh the columbus metropolitan club again and our guests at home so with that i'm going to turn it over to steve Thanks, Derek. I hope you found today's forum, period. That means you're watching. So um, we wish you were here with us, but we appreciate your viewing time and involvement. Thanks to our sponsors, Hannah News Service, Ohio Farm Bureau Federation, and Civic Point. And thanks to our speakers, Kyle Kondik, Latrice Washington, Karen Kassler, and Derek Clay. Be well, wash your hands, and we hope to see you soon here for uh, a forum. But in the meantime, for a live stream. Thank you. Thank you.